foot-tall beehives, fainting Elvis fans, communist paranoia, and the bomb. The years after World War II were filled with excitement as the economy exploded, politicians regrouped, and society changed dramatically. President Harry Truman proclaimed, we want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. If we can put this tremendous machine of ours, which has made this victory possible, to work for peace, we can look forward to the greatest age in the history of mankind. In the decades following the end of the Second World War, the great age that President Harry Truman had wished for came true to millions of Americans. The United States entered a period of unprecedented economic growth and prosperity that for the first time in history boosted a majority of American families into the middle class and made their American dream a reality. Tired of years of wartime shortages, Americans spent their money on the new consumer goods that poured out of American factories. Cars were especially hot items. Sometimes people paid more than dealers were asking, just so they could get one quickly. The federal government also helped the surging economy. Defense contracts poured billions of dollars into U.S. businesses. Continued government funding for research stimulated innovations in the electronics and aerospace industries and in scientific research. The United States was once again the land of opportunity as newly trained scientists, business leaders, and workers turned their attention to producing new inventions, televisions, radios, and gadgets of all kinds. As sales soared, American corporations grew bigger and more profitable than ever before. And corporate leaders like Henry Ford II and RCA's David Sarnoff became national heroes. New technologies were also enabling factories to produce more goods with fewer workers. America's booming mass consumer economy was also changing the very nature of work. What must be grasped is the picture of society as a great sales room, an enormous fire, an incorporated brain, a new universe of management and manipulation. C. Wright Mills, sociologist. More and more people worked in offices or provided services as members of the country's exploding white-collar workforce. The old middle class, which was your professional classes, your managerial classes, is now expanding downward to include the people who made the washing machines and the dryers, the cars, the jeeps, and uh, the airplanes, and so on. So that people who before the war would have been considered working class factory workers become members of the middle class. Farmers also prospered as new machines, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides revolutionized American agriculture. In 1910, one farmer could feed eight people a year. By 1950, one farmer fed 15. Foreign tourists marveled at the fruit, vegetables, and packaged goods that overflowed supermarket shelves. Even dog food came in several varieties and flavors. It's interesting how we invent labels to describe one era or another. And sometimes we call the period after 1945, after the end of World War II, the affluent era. But that hides the other side of America that remained mired in poverty, in substandard housing, who couldn't achieve the American dream. Not everyone participated in the prosperity of the post-war era. Many American women who had worked during the war were sent home to make room for returning GIs. African Americans and other minorities found that racial discrimination let them climb only so far up the economic ladder of opportunity. Many Americans still lived in poverty. 
These were real problems. And President Harry Truman figured he had the solution. When the war first ended, President Harry Truman faced the problem of reconverting the economy to peacetime production. Many people feared that the war's end might bring back the Great Depression. To ease returning veterans back into the workforce, Congress passed the GI Bill, which offered a low-cost education and low-interest loans to buy homes and start businesses. The GI Bill funded the construction of hundreds of thousands of small tract houses, which were not only affordable, but were made even more affordable by virtue of a loan program which eliminated the down payment so that for $100 you were given the key to a new home and the government insured the mortgage. Millions of veterans used their GI benefits to get good educations, buy a home, and enter the white-collar workforce. Easier access to higher education changed the face of the nation's colleges and universities and created the new perception that a college education was for everyone, not just the wealthy or super intellectual. Building on Roosevelt's New Deal, President Truman wanted the federal government to help provide what he called a fair deal for the American people. Truman pushed for a higher minimum wage, extended Social Security benefits to 10 million new workers, and fought for public housing and other programs to help the poor. The years following World War II also witnessed a series of breakthroughs for African Americans, as Jackie Robinson broke the color line in Major League Baseball in 1947, and Ralph Bunch won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950. Feeling a special moral obligation to African Americans for their patriotism in World War II, President Truman set up a Presidential Committee on Civil Rights, which soon called for laws to end lynching and segregation. Our immediate task is to remove the last remnants of the barriers which stand between millions of our citizens and their birthright. There is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry or religion or race or color. In 1948, Truman issued an executive order to end segregation in the United States Armed Forces. Truman's fair deal ran up against stiff opposition. Angered at the president's support of black civil rights, Southern Democrats, called Dixiecrats, left the Democratic Party in the presidential election of 1948 and set up their state's rights, or Dixiecrat Party. Republicans demanded a quick end to the Democrats' New Deal and Fair Deal programs. And with the return of prosperity, growing numbers of white Americans agreed. But in the presidential election of 1948, Truman surprised his critics and the pollsters by winning one of the closest elections in American history. The president rode back into office on the basis of returns from Ohio, a state that Dewey had won four years before. It was 11 o'clock the next morning before Dewey conceded, and later the president attended a victory dinner. This is Levittown, all yours for $58. You're a lucky fellow, Mr. Veteran. Uncle Sam and the world's largest builder have made it possible for you to live in a charming house in a delightful community without having to pay for them with your eye teeth. The day after this ad ran, 1,400 eager families lined up in a single day to buy a four-room house from Bill Levitt. People wanted convenient, affordable housing, and they wanted it now. To fill the need, Bill Levitt started producing homes like Henry Ford produced Model Ts, simple, durable, and inexpensive. Americans poured into the new suburban communities springing up on the crabgrass frontier. Here, people found their American dreams. 
prosperity allowed new suburbanites to fill their houses with new furniture and the latest appliances and to pursue lives built around home and family. Backed by a thriving economy and GI Bill benefits, Americans began to marry younger and faster than ever before. And once they married, they began to have children. Lots of children. Lots and lots of children. The baby boomers, as they're called, became the largest generation in the nation's history. They would grow up in the most affluent society in the history of the world and share their homes with an invention that would transform American civilization. Retreating into their new playrooms and dens, Americans spent their evenings with their eyes glued to the set. By the 1960s, Americans on average spent more time watching television than doing anything else but sleep and work. The movie theaters, uh, drama, museums, all these things, uh, it's not that important to after work uh, to now jump in the car and drive uh, 30 miles for the second time that day to have some sort of social or cultural life that uh, was in the city. Um, TV would take the cultural life and send it to you. From the very beginning, advertising was the life's blood of television, which was unsurpassed in its ability to sell standardized products to a mass audience. Game shows like The Price is Right and The $64,000 Question brought the flood of new brand name goods into American homes. Soon, more advertising dollars were spent on television than on any other medium. Television shows like Ozzy and Harriet and Father Knows Best reflected Americans' interest in home and family. They showed Americans what the perfect family should look like. A strong father with a good job, a sweet mother who cooked and took care of the home, and well-behaved, if sometimes mischievous, children. With dad able to earn enough money on his own to provide for the whole family, more and more Americans came to believe that a woman's place was in the home, supporting her husband and caring for her children. After we got out of the service and married, uh, our generation was expected to stay home, keep the house and raise the children, which is what a majority of us did. A lot of the fellas went to school on the GI Bill. We bought homes, bought appliances, sent our children to dancing school. At the same time, more women were working than ever before. But employers usually paid them less, reasoning that men were the real breadwinners, so women didn't need an equal wage. There was much less dissatisfaction with the inequity in pay initially at the end of the war. Uh, in part because most women agreed generally that the husband was to be the breadwinner and the ideal family was being shown to them in the magazines, in the newspapers, in Life magazine, for example, and on the television. Many suburban women were pleased with their lives. They found constructive outlets working for the PTA, church groups, and other organizations. But beneath the surface of happy conformity was a growing undercurrent of unrest. Companies which made a big profit selling us all those washing machines, dryers, freezers, and second cars were overselling us on the bliss of domesticity to sell us more things. In 1963, Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, would help expose the hidden problems of American housewives and help fuel the feminist movement of the 1960s. But in the 1950s, all appeared well with the American family. The same could not, however, be said about developments elsewhere in the world. During World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union had been allies against Nazi Germany. But after the war, that alliance quickly disintegrated. Determined to protect itself from future invasion from the West and to advance communism, the Soviet Union, at the end of World War II, took control of countries in Eastern Europe and an iron curtain descended across the continent. At the present moment, in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. 
the choice is too often not a free one. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority, forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Fearing Soviet aggression, President Truman and Congress adopted a policy of containment, the objective of which was to prevent further Soviet or communist expansion. To combat communism, the United States embarked upon an unprecedented involvement in world affairs. In 1947, Truman persuaded Congress to send $400 million to Greece and Turkey to prevent communist takeovers. That same year, the Marshall Plan began a multi-billion dollar program in economic aid to help nations in Western Europe get back on their feet and prevent the spread of communism. The United States also set up military bases around the world and entered into military alliances with Latin American, European, and Asian nations. In 1949, the United States organized the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, its first peacetime military alliance with Europe since the American Revolution. That same year, China's long and bitter civil war ended when communist armies, led by Mao Zedong, defeated Chiang Kai-shek's American-backed nationalists. The world's most populous nation was now under communist control. On a map, more than half of the world now looked red. The communist-led North Korean army plunged across the line which separated it from free South Korea. Now, once again, the soldier was on foreign soil, making his soldier's way through the kind of troubles which had always beset his brothers. When communist North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950, the Cold War turned hot. Truman sent American troops into Korea and anticipated a quick victory. But when troops from the United States and its UN allies got too close to the Chinese border, 33 Chinese divisions poured into North Korea and pushed them back to the 38th parallel. Alarmed by Truman's apparent inability to win the war, Americans elected Dwight D. Eisenhower president in 1952. Threatening the use of nuclear force, Eisenhower prodded the North Koreans into signing a ceasefire in 1953. By then, more than 54,000 Americans had lost their lives. Determined not just to contain, but to roll back communist expansion, President Eisenhower wanted to increase American military strength. But Ike also had promised to reduce government spending. How was he to increase the military without running up the national debt? Eisenhower found the answer by shifting from costly troops and conventional weapons to a reliance upon air power and nuclear weapons. This, said Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, would provide more bang for the buck. A new policy of massive retaliation threatened the Soviet Union and China with nuclear obliteration should they attack the United States or its allies. Afraid that the United States' nuclear advantage would put them at the mercy of the United States, the Soviet Union accelerated its own missile program. The nuclear arms race was on. Fear soared as each country rushed to develop and test hydrogen bombs, a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bombs the United States had dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. 
The arms race between Soviets and Americans would last for close to 40 years. By the time the Cold War ended in 1991, it had cost trillions of dollars and created enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world many times over. Duck and cover. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. One of the unexpected, unanticipated outcomes of the war was the direct result of our use of the atomic bomb. We had unleashed into the world a force that had never been seen before. And for many of us, that was a terribly frightening force to have unleashed. And the possibility that people who did not share our value system might also get a hold of it and use it on us was a throbbing fear. The possibility of nuclear war struck terror in the hearts of Americans. When the air raid sirens blew, children were drilled to duck and cover. They crouched under their desks or marched to basement air raid shelters stockpiled with food and water. Some families built bomb shelters in their own backyards so they could live through a nuclear attack. This is a modern home. This is a prepared home in the nuclear age. The housekeeping problem of living in a shelter will begin as soon as the shelter is occupied. All shelters should include clothing, bedding, rubber sheets and special equipment for the sick, writing materials, reading materials, games and amusement for the children. No matter where you live, a fallout shelter is necessary insurance. It will not be needed except in an emergency, but in an emergency, it will be priceless, as priceless as your life. The bomb shelter was an eerie symbol of the nuclear family in the nuclear age. Families wanted to seal themselves off from the growing dangers of the outside world. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It was the $64,000 question. Answer correctly, and your life might return to normal. Give the wrong answer, or refuse to answer at all, and your life was ruined. In the years following World War II, Americans' fear of communism and nuclear war led to mass hysteria fueled by politicians and others who wanted Americans not only to support the war against communism, but also to view the world as they viewed it. This was the country's second Red Scare, more intense than the fear that erupted after the communist takeover of Russia in 1917. Between 1945 and 1952, Congressional committees conducted 82 hearings investigating communist influence in the entertainment industry, higher education, unions, and the federal government. The most infamous hearings began in 1947, when Congressman J. Parnell Thomas's House Un-American Activities Committee conducted hearings on communist influence in Hollywood. Calling the House Un-American Activities Committee to order, Chairman J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey opens an inquiry into possible communist penetration of the Hollywood film industry. The committee is seeking to determine if Red Party members have reached the screen with subversive propaganda. I want to emphasize at the outset of these hearings that the fact that the Committee on Un-American Activities is investigating alleged communist influence and infiltration in the moving picture industry must not be considered or interpret it as an attack on the industry itself. A long list of prominent motion picture witnesses appear before the committee. Speaking for the films, Eric Johnston, president of the Motion Picture Association, talks frankly concerning the attitude of the producers. We are accused of having communists and communist sympathizers in our employ. Undoubtedly, there are such persons in Hollywood, as you will find elsewhere in America. But we neither shield nor defend them. 
We want them exposed. Witnesses were forced not only to tell about their own activities and beliefs, but to talk about their friends and co-workers. Invoking the First Amendment, which protects the right to freedom of speech, a group of Hollywood writers and directors, known as the Hollywood Ten, went to jail rather than answer questions about their political beliefs. Today, we call the anti-communist hysteria of the post-war McCarthyism, a name synonymous with the excesses of Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. Between 1950 and 1954, McCarthy ran a campaign of terror from his Senate subcommittee that curbed free speech, ruined many people's lives, and made people afraid to express political opinions different from hostile anti-communists. McCarthy's reckless and undocumented accusations against government employees and others won him tremendous political power and public support. Very few had the courage to speak out against McCarthy. One of the first was Margaret Chase Smith, a Republican senator from Maine, who condemned communist witch hunts on the Senate floor on June 1, 1950. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who, by our own words and acts, ignore some of the basic principles of Americanism. The right to criticize. The right to hold unpopular beliefs. The right to protest. The right of independent thought. Margaret Chase Smith. Despite its excesses, the Red Scare dragged on for years. McCarthy's fall from power finally came in 1954, when he went after supposed communists in the U.S. Army. I resent very, very much this attempt to connect the great American army with this, this attempt to uh, sabotage the efforts of this committee's investigation into communism. Americans watching the hearings on television were appalled by McCarthy's bullying of witnesses and falsification of evidence. No longer finding him a political asset, Republican senators joined their Democratic colleagues in a formal censure of McCarthy. His reign of terror was over. Years of investigations and hearings turned up few actual communists. But the second Red Scare did cost thousands of people their jobs and created a pervasive atmosphere of fear. The anti-communists attacked not just alleged Communist Party members and sympathizers, but labor unions and school teachers, civil rights workers, new dealers, and others who questioned the directions that American post-war society was taking. The entertainment industry avoided controversy by blacklisting hundreds of people. Hollywood and television stopped making films and shows dealing with social issues and stepped up production of light-hearted musicals and comedies and action adventures with law and order and anti-communist themes. Conformity and consensus, a coercive narrowing of public speech and opinion came to dominate American life. But even as the Red Scare gripped the nation, events in the American South were laying the groundwork for perhaps the greatest social movement of the 20th century. In the years following World War II, African Americans were growing tired of the same old calls for patience. Backed by the Cold War rhetoric that spoke of the United States as the land of liberty and equality, and by the economic gains that they had made since the end of the Great Depression, African Americans mobilized to end the American South's system of racial segregation and discrimination. After the war, NAACP lawyers mounted a constitutional challenge on segregation in the nation's schools on the grounds that separate education was inherently unequal. 
In 1954, the United States Supreme Court agreed. The court ruled that to separate children in school solely because of their race generates feelings of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. The Supreme Court's ruling in Brown v. the Board of Education overturned the Plessy v. Ferguson decision of 1896. After close to a half century, separate but equal was no longer the law of the land. In the years following Brown v. the Board of Education, African Americans in the South began to openly challenge segregation. In December 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white person on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And a young minister by the name of Martin Luther King led black citizens in a year-long boycott of the city's buses. In December 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that Alabama laws segregating black passengers on public transportation was unconstitutional. The next year, Congress passed the first Civil Rights Act since Reconstruction to protect African Americans' ability to vote. White supremacists in the South struck back, organizing white citizens' councils to resist integration. I will not force my people to integrate against their will. I believe in the democratic processes and principles of government wherein the people determine the problems on the local level, which is their right. In the fall of 1957, a federal court ordered school authorities in Little Rock, Arkansas to admit nine black students to the all-white Central High School. One of them was Elizabeth Eckford. I looked into the face of an old woman and it seemed a kind face. But when I looked at her again, she spat on me. Elizabeth Eckford. President Dwight D. Eisenhower preferred a gradualist approach to integration. But when Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus refused to allow Elizabeth Eckford and the other black students to enter Central High, Eisenhower sent federal troops to make sure that integration took place as the law demanded. In the following years, the civil rights movement would transform American society, dismantling the system of racial segregation that had been in existence for more than 80 years. African Americans were not the only people seeking change. American intellectuals, artists, and youths were also beginning to rebel against the consensus and conformity of the post-war world. For decades, Americans had believed that the return of prosperity would make the American dream a reality. But not everyone was happy. Rejecting artistic conventions, artists called abstract expressionists turned to their unconscious minds for inspiration. Novels like Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man gave white Americans a glimpse into the psychological costs of racial segregation. J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye told of the alienation of American kids from adult society. Teenage unhappiness in the midst of plenty expressed itself in rebellious behavior. And most alarming of all was that more and more of the young rebels without a cause came not from America's impoverished inner cities, but were middle class kids from the suburbs. In the mid-1950s, Congress held hearings on yet another threat to the nation's future, juvenile delinquency, which expert witnesses insisted was caused by the evil influences of comic books, motion pictures, and other mass media. In the 1950s, teenagers found a new soundtrack for their lives in a music that emerged, like jazz before it, from the world of African Americans. They called it rock and roll. Other youthful rebels called beatniks criticized Americans' conformity and addiction to consumer goods. They wanted nothing to do with the organization man or middle-class suburbanites who lived dull lives of drab sameness. To the beatniks, 
Affluence had not brought fulfillment of the American dream, but faceless conformity and a deadening of the human spirit. The end of World War II had ushered in an era of unprecedented prosperity. Economic growth spurred by technological advances had transformed many Americans' lives. But affluence had not solved all of the nation's problems. Even as post-war families raised their children and pursued their American dreams, movements for reform and rebellion were already taking shape and gaining momentum. In the 1960s, the United States would enter a new era of conflict and reform, an era in which Americans would again struggle to achieve freedom and justice for all.